Hey, welcome back to the podcast. If you're new, I'm a law student and rookie entrepreneur. This podcast will usually be on stories of startups and entrepreneurship, but this episode is going to be different. Later this year, Australia is going to vote on the Voice to Parliament referendum, so I thought it would be informative to get my constitutional law lecturer to talk a bit on the topic. The referendum is something that every Australian has to vote on, and right now I don't think many people know what what it's about and will be know what it's about know what they will be forced to vote on, including myself. So here to give some insight into the Voice to Parliament referendum is my constitutional law lecturer, Jeremy Bracker. Hey, Jeremy, thanks for joining the podcast. Hi, Lujan. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, of course. Um, when the semester first started, you asked every student in the class to talk a bit about themselves, um, questions like where they're from and why they decide to study law. Um, so I'm going to flip those questions back to you. Um, where are you from and why do you decide to study law? Okay. And if I might give myself a compliment, I think they're very good questions. I think it's always really important to ask people where they're from to know where they're going, to quote one of my favourite singers, Bob Marley. Um, and to answer your question, I was born in Australia, but much more importantly to understanding my background is to understand that I was born to Jewish migrants um, who were displaced. Um, my mum was a child survivor from Poland and my father was a, a French Jew um, who was basically thrown out of his country in the 1950s, just denationalised from Egypt and found his way to Australia as, an, as a migrant in the early um, 50s. So I grew up to as a first-generation Australian and very acutely aware of how vulnerable minorities can be and how difficult um, po politics can be when they affect people um, and humans and families and identities. Um, but I was brought up in a way in which education was given a huge emphasis. And so from a really young age, I was very drawn to any information or knowledge that could help me help my parents or help my community. Um, and so in some ways, law, with all its promise and the lure of justice and righting wrongs and winning in court, was a very attractive magnetic option for me. And so I knew I wanted to study law from probably the age of about 13. I was already very committed and passionate wow. debater at school and very interested in every law show that I could watch. Wow, that's that's quite a story or quite a background. Um, um, for with that with that background, was there anything that surprised you about the legal profession that uh, law school didn't quite prepare you for? That's a great question, and I think the answer is absolutely. Um, when I first started practicing law, I was very lucky enough to work with a law firm called Arnold Block Liebler, um, which on the one hand is a sort of gun tax commercial law firm, but on the other, a really extraordinary collection of passionate individuals trying to also um, contribute to Indigenous rights, Indigenous justice, particularly because of their Jewish um, heritage. So the leading um, lawyer there sort of uh, took me under his wing when I first graduated and I was able to work and help on some of those cases. That was probably what got my interest in Indigenous stuff. Um, but look, one of the things about realities, uh, whether it's vocational or otherwise, is that you, you know, are often confronted warts and all with all the contradictions of practising um, in the real world, um, long hours, egos, uh, pettiness, lots of stuff that just happens in, in the world that has nothing to do with justice or human rights. Um, so it was very clear to me after a couple of years or a few years of practising law that I wanted to sort of spread my wings and I ended up leaving Australia and working um, with an engineer and um, doing lots of sort of other things beyond just practicing black letter law. Mm, cool. That's, that's quite interesting. Like uh, I hear a lot of people get into law, find some things that they don't really enjoy about it and then get into something that they're a bit more passionate about. Um, mm -hmm. When I, when I asked my, I, I got a bit excited and asked some of my friends, I told some of my friends that they, um that I'd be 
talking to my constitutional lecturer on the podcast and they were like can you can you ask him why he decided to uh get into teaching because I'm not quite sure why people do that so um well why did why, why did you get into teaching was it uh for, for fulfillment maybe it's a bit slower pace or um to maybe um do some research um mm, pretty much all of the above actually um it started that I was living in Israel and working um in human rights and peace building and ended up being very interested in a field called transitional justice, which is all about how societies um, in conflict after conflict deal with mass human rights abuses. And when I started getting interested in that area, it became obvious to me that it might be a good idea to do some research. And when I kind of got pushed or sort of encouraged to do a PhD and I started that, um, Teaching became a really good option to supplement my um, very modest scholarship. And, you know, I, I have a background in working with youth um, growing up in the Jewish community. And so for me, teaching was an extension of that. And it's fun. Like, it's fun to connect with people. And it's fun to connect with people, particularly in areas that are really um, important and touch on political matters and law, particularly constitutional law, does that. Um, so I enjoyed very much the teaching and, um, there is a slower pace to it. You're right. And that, that, you know, it means it gives you freedom so that you don't have to be, um, kind of stuck behind a desk for 10 hours a day, which is something that I didn't love very much about professional practice. Um, and it's rewarding. It's lovely to connect with humans and particularly when you feel like you might even have an opportunity to shape those humans or perhaps gently nudge them in a direction that might they might otherwise not have gone in. Or, um, and teaching, I'll just end by saying this, like I think we teach what we need to learn most. So um, it's not the case that I stand up in front of a class and I understand every single thing that I teach. Sometimes through the teaching, it helps me learn as well. So it's a dialogue and I really enjoy that. Cool. Yeah, I will say you are you are one of the, the, the better lecturers that I've had throughout my degree. So I'm, I'm very grateful that you are you are my lecturer and you, you have decided to come on the podcast, share, share a bit more about yourself. Thanks. That's very kind. That's nice to hear. So um, to the main question, um, what is the voice to parliament and, and why should people care? Well, the voice to parliament um, is the culmination or the end product of more than 10 years of discussion and policy debate and conferences and dialogues around how do we address our Indigenous people and how do we reconcile um, a history of colonization and dispossession and the cold hard reality that Indigenous Australians are in a very um, compromised position because they are the most incarcerated people in our country. They have the poorest health. They are the poorest. They live in the most crowded houses and all government policy by um, bureaucrats in Canberra has um commonly miss the mark and not manage to address this. Australia is one of the most wealthy, privileged, gold-plated democracies in the world, and yet we haven't been able to heal, address, and recognise our first Australians, a, a group of people who um, were not just the first inhabitants of this land, but also had thousands of years of a rich, vibrant, and sophisticated civilization in their own right that for many years or until today in many ways was ignored, um, invalidated and marginalized. And from my perspective, most difficult, most controversially through the law. So under the color of the law, um, children were taken away from their parents and from their families. So the question of how to deal with this um, has been plaguing both Indigenous leaders but also Australian leaders for decades. And in the Uluru Statement of the Heart, um, which was a, a group of um, 
of regional dialogues that took place with um, over 50 different Indigenous representative groups across the country, we were extended not um, with uh, a demand or met with violence or guns or terrorism like many other countries are with groups that are so um, poorly treated and so persecuted, but in fact, we were extended this very big-hearted, warm representation. And I would encourage every listener um, to this podcast, including anyone that is about to vote um, in uh, October at the referendum, to read the Uluru Statement of the Heart. It is quite simply poetry. It's only about two paragraphs, and it's an invitation for Australians to understand that all Indigenous Australians are asking is to be seen, to be heard, and to be given an opportunity to thrive in Australia. Um, and what they've asked for um, in this order is a voice to Parliament, a truth-telling process so that white Australia can know what the history is of this country, the real history, not the kind of history that I grew up with at school about Captain Cook and you know, Aborigines on, you know, throwing um, boomerangs on tea tails, but the real history of this country, um, which is not um, warts and all, not all about, um, you know, eating scones and, and lamingtons. Um, and they've also asked for a treaty, things that exist in other countries that are New Zealand. Um, and we're about to vote in October on the first bit of it, which is the voice. So that's a very long answer, but to now get to the real bit of your question, which is what's the voice? The voice to Parliament is basically doing two things. Firstly, it's changing the constitution to allow for recognition of Indigenous people in that constitution, to just recognise them, okay? Just a recognition that the Indigenous people exist, that they're there and they have been in Australia, um, and a recognition that in some ways is a remedy to the fact that the constitution um, excluded them um, in 1901, and even since the referendum in 67 has continued to exclude them. And secondly, the voice to parliament is an, invites um, Australians, Australian politicians and the executive um, and members of the government to hear from indigenous communities on issues that affect them. So the voice gives them an ability to represent, make submissions to government on issues that affect them. Um, it's not binding. It doesn't change um, any structures of government. It just requires that the bureaucrats in Canberra hear the people for whom the policy will be um, affecting and, and for whom to, against whom the policies will be implemented or in some ways um, uh, advocated. And in my view, it feels like a no-brainer to recognise Indigenous people because they are the First Nations and they have had a pretty rough go and they do have a special connection and unique connection to Australian ways in which me as a first-generation Australian doesn't have, so it's a no-brainer. And to allow people um, who have been victims of such failed policy to have agency and autonomy over um, representations to government also feels like a no-brainer. So that's a very long answer, but that's my best explanation. Thanks for that. Um, no, it was, it was good. Um, something that, that I have a um, key concern over, though, is that um, if um, the executive and parliament don't really have to take any of their um, opinions or considerations seriously, would it more so just be symbolic in um, in its representation at, in the referendum? Well, that's a very good question. And the answer to that is twofold. Firstly, um, I would start by saying that I actually think that this is very practical. And it's practical because if bureaucrats in Canberra and politicians have to listen to the people um, for whom they're going to make policy, then it can shape and inform the policy they make. And it also brings the public's attention to what the people for whom the policy is being tailored or, or, or made think about that policy. So that's a really practical step that doesn't exist at the moment. Um, and what's happened for decades is that Canberra politicians with the, sometimes the best and also sometimes the worst of intentions make policy without 
properly speaking to representative groups without knowing who to ask or even if they know who to ask, not listening or, or giving them an opportunity to represent on their opinions. And that policy has, as we've seen for decades, failed. So I actually think it's super practical. I don't think it's me symbolism. And to make the point even clearer, advisory bodies to parliament exist in many areas. It's not just about Indigenous voice. We have voices um, to parliament in areas like, you know, the Fair uh, Work Commission make representations to parliament on good employment practices and Bureau of Meteorolo Meteorology makes uh, representations to parliament on the weather. And, you know, we have um, all sorts of bodies um, that make representations and advocate to parliament all the time. But because the Indigenous people have been so excluded <coughs> and marginalised from the political process, this body would give them a voice and bring them up to the level of um, political agency that other groups have had for years and enjoyed for years. The second point I wanted to make is that to the extent that recognising Indigenous people in the constitution and giving them a voice, um, even if it's non-binding, is symbolic, symbolism counts. Symbolism is super important. Ask any community, including white Australia, about their flags and their symbols, and they'll tell you how important it is. Imagine white Australians not being able to cheer for the Matildas with the symbols of green and gold or the flag of Australia. Symbols matter, symbols count, symbols make people feel heard and seen, and the community that most needs that in today's Australia is our first Australians. Wow. Okay, those are those are some answers that I was I was I didn't even consider, but like they they definitely make strong sense to me now that now that you've said it. Um, I think I think the final final part on that on that topic is um, to to make an informed decision, you you definitely have to go go both take both sides um into account. So what's an what's a strong consideration against passing um the voice to parliament because it is really hard to to pass referendums in, in any case, but yeah. It is, but I would invite you and listeners to consider this as a, a non-political issue. And I know it's become politicised because we have a, um, let's say, um, certain groups in the community that have chosen to politicise it, but this is not a political issue. It shouldn't have to be. And I don't think that there is any good reason to not vote yes or to oppose the voice. The only two reasons I can think of that motivate the no campaign are ignorance, misinformation, which I know is a really rampant thing in, in an era of social media and post-truth and Trumpism and populism, but it really is ignorance and misinformation. Um, there's not one compelling argument I've heard from the no side, frankly, um, that is grounded in fact. Um, Rather, it plays on fears and distortions and manipulations. And frankly, the second major um, motivation from the no campaign is prejudice. Um, it's not the, so, you know, um, all racists will vote no. It's not the case that every person that votes no is a racist, but all racists will vote no. And at the end of the day, when you make your call at the ballot box, you want to look at the politicians and judges that support this. Some of the most conservative judges, judges in the country support the voice because they know that this is a generous, modest request um, and it's high time that we accept that request and hold hands with our Indigenous brothers and sisters in Australia and say that Australia cares enough to extend um, a hand back to the very generous invitation. Um, but beyond ignorance and prejudice, I can't see any um, persuasive, reasonable, cogent, intelligent argument as to why on earth you wouldn't support a voice to parliament. Nice. Okay, yeah, there's uh, there's definitely some some important um, key takeaways. I think like my my best argument against it um, was, was that it was purely symbolic, but now that you've said that, 
like it is true that um symbolism is important but i didn't necessarily take that fully into consideration um now now that you've kind of gone through those those steps like i mean i, I don't really have any other reason to vote no so yeah you've definitely got me convinced there um yeah all right um it's more than having not enough reason to vote no it's that it's really important as australians with all the privilege that we enjoy and um to understand that we have huge power to help a people that has been so oppressed, marginalised and persecuted to be seen. And there's no skin off our nose in doing that, right? It makes no difference to our lives practically whether we acknowledge Indigenous Australians. There's no adverse effect of that. Whether they get to make representations on things that affect them, there's no adverse effect. It's not threatening in any way. On the contrary, it, like it should be something that we can be proud of and generous about and feel good about as white Australians or as members of, I mean, I'm not white Australian, neither are you. Um, I'm assuming that your family wasn't born in Australia. No. So we're the beneficiaries of this incredible country. And so it's not just no reason not to vote. It's you actually have a duty to vote. Yes, of course you do. Like you're the beneficiary of a country that has given your family refuge and opportunity and privilege. You're studying law at RMIT. You might think that that's, you know, a, a given, but that's not a given. That's a privilege. And part of your privilege is to understand that you have a responsibility to vote yes. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, it's definitely, definitely humbling, I feel like. So, yeah. Um, moving on to, to kind of curious and a bit more lighthearted questions. Um, Obama, early in his career, was a constitutional law lecturer. Um, I'm kind of curious, do you have any ambitions on getting into politics? Not really, not in the immediate future. No, I don't think, I think Obama is a very gifted leader um, and has a personality that I think is far more conducive to diplomacy and being moderate and nuanced. I'm a bit more passionate and wear my heart on my sleeve. I don't think that's great um, assets for politicians. I think you, you have some some key key aspects or assets that are that are quite good. That would be quite good in politics, kind of explaining what is important in in details that everyone can understand. And you're very you're very vocal and passionate. So I think those are all very important to get into politics. I agree, but I, but I think um that's probably why it makes me best place to stay behind the lectern at the lecture hall okay you never know <laughs> um okay um probably probably the final question then is um do you have a favorite book or podcast that you usually recommend to people and and keep in mind i probably will read it if um if it's strongly strongly recommended <laughs> like i have a full full library behind me just of trophies of what i really um enjoy reading mm -hmm. um i'm gonna go with podcasts because i'm a big fan of podcasts um the podcast that i really am appreciating at the moment and i'm a bit sort of novelty seeking so i kind of fall in love with a podcast and then change my mind after like not to my mind but I end up finding another one but at the moment i'm listening to a podcast with um a, a, um it's called 10 percent happier um, and it's a, I'm very interested in mindfulness and meditation. And it's a podcast that looks at human experience can be improved even 10% about sharpening our consciousness, our emotional resilience, um, our training to overcome our negativity bias as, as humans. Um, being a teacher and a lecturer and now thankfully a parent, it's not just about, you know, things that you can find in books, but it's also about ways in which you move in the world that brings more joy and clarity. These are things I'm interested in. So Dan Harris is a uh, American journalist who had his first panic attack as he was the anchor on a news, uh, um, delivering the news on the news uh, outlet. And since his panic attack, he discovered meditation. And now he runs his own podcast called 10% Happier, um, he interviews some extraordinary people um, and I would highly recommend listening to one of his interviews. Cool. Yeah, 
sounds sounds like it could be interesting. So I'll definitely have to check that out. Um, yeah, I think I think that's probably a good spot to to wrap things up. Um, thanks for educating us a bit, and uh, it was definitely a privilege having you on the podcast. Thank you, Luchin. Thank you for inviting me.